Hello and welcome to lecture number three. Uh, in this lecture I will be talking about two topics, vectors and projectile motion. I will begin with the subject of vectors. Um, I'm going to assume that you know what a vector is. Uh, as you may know, uh, quantities come in two different kinds. One, a quantity that has a magnitude and a quantity that has a magnitude and direction. The quantity that has a magnitude only uh, is called scalar, scalar magnitude. Oop, um, trying to get the pencil to write. Scalars. So an example of scalar would be something like temperature, um, mass, volume, and also say speed. All right. Uh, a vector is a magnitude plus direction. So for example, we say speed is a scalar, but velocity what is velocity? It's actually two things, a speed and the direction. For example, I could say my speed is 55 miles an hour. That's my speed. But my velocity is 55 miles an hour north. You see what I'm saying? So once I specify the direction, it becomes the velocity, okay? Um, another example of vector would be acceleration and also the force. Those are the three major variables that we deal with as vectors. So for example, the force when you walk into, let's say you're going uh, towards the mall and you stop at the door and you see a sign on the door that says push. Well, it gives you a sense of direction, this word, so you push. So you exert a force in the up in the direction against your body to open the door. If it tells, if it says pull, you 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 uh, exert a force in a certain direction, and so on. So the word itself gives you a sense of direction. So such words or such actions are called vectors. Okay. So vector is a is a magnitude and a direction, where a scalar such as temperature. It's just a magnitude. Say your temperature is 37 degrees Celsius. That's it. There is no sense of direction to that temperature. You see what I'm saying? Okay. Um, and as you know, the vector is, whoops, uh, the vector can be represented uh, as a um, an arrow and something like that. And we we have, let's say, the vector A. And I put an arrow on top of it to indicate that this is a vector. And the direction of the vector, there are two ways of specifying direction. I can either specify it by the angle. So I say, for example, this vector is directed uh, at an angle of, say, 45 degrees with respect to the x-axis, for example. You see what I'm saying? Um, another way of representing vector is by the components i, j, k. I hope you are familiar with them. Uh, for example, if I have here... Uh, X, Y, and Z here. Uh, there are small unit vectors here. They're called <coughs> I, J, K. These are unit vectors I, J, and K. So, for example, let, let me go back to the drawing of the vector here. So, let's say I have this vector here, A. So it has two components. Of course, this is the y-axis. This is the x-axis. I'm, I'm only taking the two dimensions for now. And so this part from here to here, let me use my mouse. This part from the origin all the way to here is we call it the x component, a sub x. Okay, the, the, the x component of the vector. And then the y component from the from where the this uh, point right here all the way to the origin and that's a sub y i can of course I specify a sub y right here as well right it's right here from here to from the tip of the vector down to here so basically if i take this 
triangle. See this triangle right here? I can draw it right here. That's not very good. You know, I've, I've been using this mouth, this pen for a long time, and I still haven't mastered it yet. It's, um, anyway, there it is. I'm trying to make it as vertical as I can. There we go. So we have a triangle that looks something like that. And this is uh, the vector A. <clears throat> this is A sub Y. This is A sub X. And then we have here, go back to the, so this is the angle theta. I'm going to put it right here. Notice that by looking at that, I have a triangle, and I can use basic trigonometry. As you can see here, um, a sub x is equal to a cosine theta, and a sub y is equal to a, oops, a sine theta, that's what I want to say, a sine theta. You see what I'm saying? The reason for that is because, um, uh, you know, uh, sine theta is opposite over hypotenuse and cosine theta is adjacent over hypotenuse. I, I, I hope you know that. This stuff is easy. You studied it in, in junior high, basic trigonometry. So this is how we specify the X and Y component of a vector, okay? Um, we can also look at the angle theta here, and we can say that tangent theta is equal to ay over ax. Why is that? Because <clears throat> if you remember, a uh, tangent theta is opposite. Tangent theta is opposite over adjacent. So ay over ax. So this is how I specify the angle. So in other words, theta is equal to tan inverse of a sub y over a sub x. I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, uh, solve some problems to show you how all of that applies. But uh, I'm, I'm right now just covering the theory behind it. Uh, another way of representing a vector A, this one, this vector right here, is like I said with the IJK, those unit vectors right here. And the way you do that is, again, go back to this diagram right here. So we have the vector A right here, right? And then I have A sub Y and then A sub X. <clears throat> so you can think of like, uh, let, let me put a different color. Uh, if I have, uh, let's say, in this case, uh, the the unit vector i would be somewhere here like that, and the unit vector j will be something like that. Of course, the j the k would be here, you know, as a z component. But we'll ignore it for now. We're not doing the the third dimension yet. Okay. So if I have that, I can uh, I can draw or sorry, uh, I can write the vector represent it in terms of ijk like this a vector which is this one that I have that i have right here is equal to a sub x i plus a sub y j see that so that's how i would represent it okay so this is more uh, popular this representation of a vector is more uh, popular than uh, 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 than this one. You see what I'm saying? Do you hear my cat? I need to see what my cat. Why my cat is meowing? I'll be right back. Okay, I'm back. So, for example, if I have a vector, again, this is my x and y axis, and let's say I have a vector here. I'm going to call it a, and suppose that a sub x. Or, I mean, rather, suppose that this point right here is, say, 3 on the x-axis, right? And this point here is, let's say, 2, for example, on the y-axis. So, um, to represent this vector, I can easily say that A, uh, let me put it up a little bit. I can easily say that, again, while looking at this one right here, so A is equal to 3i plus 2j. You see that? So that's how I would write the vector in terms of ij. You got that? Um, now, uh, if I want to know the angle, suppose that the angle is not given to me. Well, let's 
shouldn't be difficult. I already know that. Here is my triangle, right? This is uh, 3 right here, right? And this is 2. And this A, I don't know the A yet, okay? But I know, I, I need to know uh, the angle theta here. As you know, the angle, excuse me, the tangent theta is opposite over adjacent. So that's 2 over 3. So theta is equal to tan inverse of 2 over 3. And by calculating that, you can calculate this with me. Make sure that your calculator is on the degree mode. So I have here um, inverse tan 2 divided by 3. Answer is uh, roughly about 30, 33.7. So the angle here is theta 33.7 degrees. There we go. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't look pretty. Theta equal 33.7 degrees. Okay. Now, if I want to know the vector itself, A, you know, the magnitude of the vector, the magnitude, your math teacher would write it this way. He uses this ugly symbol. In physics, we just put A without the arrow. So you, you put an arrow for a vector, but for a scalar, you just take that. So that's it. So the A here would be basically what? The Pythagorean. Uh, in other words, what is the Pythagorean, which is basically the length of the hypotenuse. So it's going to be 2 squared plus 3 squared under the square root. So it's going to be the square root of 2 squared plus 3 squared, and that will give me square root of 4 plus 9, so that will be a square root of 13, and therefore A is equal to the square root of 13, uh, and that is um, equals to 3.6, so that will be 3.6. And there we go, I know everything about the vector now. So uh, given this uh, diagram, I am able to write the vector in terms of i and j like that, which is the most, this is the more elegant way of representing a vector, okay, in physics and engineering and uh, in the scientific uh, field. Um, and then the magnitude of the vector is simply the Pythagorean. So basically take the, uh, the, um, the x component squared plus the y component squared under the root, and that will give you the uh, the magnitude of the vector, okay, 3.6 for this uh, for this case, and then if I want to know the direction of the vector in terms of polar angle uh, theta here, simply take the tangent of the opposite over hypotenuse, just like I've done here, and the angle is 33. You see what I'm saying? 33.7. And there we go. This is how I would represent a basic vector. Got it, everybody? Okay. Um, so uh, let me. Let me do, let's suppose that we have three, four vectors together. How do we solve and find the resultant vector? This is probably the most important uh, area of vector that you need to master. And that is, if you're given a number of vectors uh, that are working together, you know what I mean? And what is the resultant vector? What is the net vector? What, what, I mean, first of all, let me explain to you why this is important. Suppose, for example, uh, let's say there is a table. Say this is a table right here, all right? And this table, uh, I have a bunch of five people are fighting over it. They want, everybody want to take the table, okay? So one person is pulling on the table this way, one person is pulling on the table this way, and one person is pulling on it, say, this way, in his own direction, her own direction. And then let's say somebody is pulling on the table in this direction, this way, okay? Now, you may remember the length of the arrow of the vector, the length, let me repeat it again with the mouse, the length of the arrow of the vector, it gives you information about its magnitude. In other words, this is probably the weakest person because the vector here is the shortest. So the longer the vector, the stronger it is in terms of force here. We're talking about force, you see what I'm saying? Um, so this pro probably the, the strongest vector here, excuse me, the strongest um, pull or force here, okay? And then this person comes next, and then this one next, and this one next, and so on, okay? So the length of the vector tells you something about the strength of the vector, the weight or the magnitude of it, okay? So anyway, go back to our example. So I have those four people, everybody's pulling on the, on the table. The question is, 
when those four people are pulling on it, everyone in his, in his own direction, which direction the table is going to move? You see what I'm saying? This is what we refer to as the resultant vector. Okay? So the resultant vector is basically given a bunch of vectors on an object, a bunch of forces on an object, pull, lift, push, whatever. You know, given a bunch of vectors on an object, as a result of that, which direction is the object to say going to move? Okay? In what direction? This is what we refer to as the resultant vector. Now, we have found a way to calculate the resultant vector precisely. In other words, it exactly what is that force, the resultant force, and exactly what direction, you know, what angle, okay? So what I'm going to do now with this, given this information, uh, uh, this uh, scenario here, imagine I, I am looking at it from a top view, okay? So I have a bird's eye looking at it from the top down. So how is it going to look like? Well, it's going to look something like that. So let me draw it. So it looks something like that. So here is my x and y. All right. And let's say, again, I'm going to draw maybe, let's say, uh, uh, three vectors. Let's just make them three vectors rather than four, just to simplify things. So suppose that I have one vector like this. Here it is. This is one guy. Remember, the table is right here. Okay? That's what I'm saying. The table is situated right at the origin. And it's not important to draw the table. I hope you know you, you believe that. It's not important to draw the table. What's important is the forces on the table. So the table is represented by the point on the origin. I'm not going to draw a table, but basically all those forces coming out of the origin, coming out of that, the table. All right. So here is one vector. Let's call it A. And let's suppose that the, the magnitude of it is 6. You know, 6... Um, six newton newton is a unit of force right and and this person is pulling on it with an angle of 45 degrees with respect to the x-axis for example all right then we have another vector let's say this is a stronger guy and he's pulling on it let's make it a little bit longer and we're going to call him c and he's pulling on it with a unit of eight, uh, you know, eight Newton, eight whatever. I'm not going to put the unit for purpose, okay? And then we have another person. Suppose, oh, I'm sorry, the, this uh, person is also, let's say it's th uh, 30 degrees with respect to the x-axis like that, all right? And then we have another guy, uh, say, uh, moving, uh, it's pulling on it in this direction like this. Okay, and he's probably the weaker of the three. And B here, let's make it four. Okay, and the angle here, let's say it is uh, 50. Um, let's say it doesn't look like 50. Hold on, let, let, me, let, me, let me draw a better one, sorry. Let's make it, I want to make it 60. And make it smaller, so there we go. So that's B, 4, and let's say this is 60 degrees, for example. And remember, I'm always drawing angles with respect to the x-axis, okay? All right, so here is the y-axis right here. And this is the way. I, so what I'm going to do is find. So again, l l let's let's back up. So imagine that the table is right here, okay? And there are those three people are pulling on it. Everybody wants the table for himself, right? The question is, which direction the table is going to move? Okay, that's what basically the resultant vector. Okay, so that's what we are looking for. How do I find the resultant vector? I'm going to give you a recipe that will work for every problem on how to find the resultant vector. All right. So the way you find it is the following. I'm going to write down the recipe first. So the question here, find the resultant vector. We're going to give the vector, resultant vector, the symbol R and, with, and direction. And when we say direction, we really mean the angle with respect to the x-axis, phi, okay? So this is the direction, phi. So when we say direction, it means angle, WRTX, with respect to the x-axis. You got it? So basically, that's what the question is. Find the resultant vector, R, and with this direction, all right? So here is how we do it. You can uh, pause the video and draw the diagram here uh, before we move any further. So here is the recipe. Let me just write down the recipe first. There are basically four steps that you need to know. First, 
I'm going to write it down first, and I will explain every step later. So the first step is resolve all vectors into components. Two. Find R sub X and R sub Y. Well, how do I find R sub X and R sub Y? Basically, uh, let me let me go back to the first step. I'm sorry. So it says resolve all vectors into components. Basically, what that means: find a sub x, a sub y, b sub x, b sub y, c sub x, and c sub y. These are the components or the constituent vectors of the three vectors that we are looking at above here. You got it? Okay. And then you want to find R sub X and R sub Y. What is R sub X and R sub Y? And they're basically the component of the resultant vector, the component of the vector that I'm looking for. Remember? I'm looking for the vector R. And that vector, every vector has components. It has X and Y component. Well, I can find them, believe it or not, before I find the vector. How do I find them? Well, it turned out that R sub X is nothing but the sum of the, uh, the R sub X is the sum of the X components of the vectors. Okay, in other words, R sub X is basically A sub X plus B sub X plus C sub X. Got it? So R sub X is A sub X plus B sub X plus C sub X. Okay, those are rules that you can memorize. And R sub Y is basically A sub Y plus B sub Y plus C sub Y. Okay? That's step number two. Step number three. Um, now, find the magnitude of the vector R. Well, how do I find the magnitude? Remember how we find the magnitude? The Pythagorean. So, R is basically... The square root of r sub x squared plus r sub y squared. Remember, we just found r sub x and r sub y from step number two right here. Okay? So all I need to do is use the Pythagorean law, and that will give me the, the magnitude. So this is the magnitude of the, of the, the vector that I'm looking for. Okay? All right. And the last step, find the direction. direction of R. Well, how do I do that? Well, the direction is basically, and I think we talked about it already, is phi equals 10 inverse of R sub Y over R sub X. Okay? So, these are the four steps. Please write them down before you move any further, and please memorize them. Really, that's my advice to you. Just memorize them, commit them to memory, because you're going to see, uh, you know, you're going to be doing resolving vectors uh, many, many, many times over. So, anyway, so let's apply this, uh, those steps to our problem here, okay? I hope you already, uh, uh, you already uh, have written it down, so I'm going to be solving it here. So go back to so we have a solution to the problem above. So the first thing I need to do is to find um, thirty and sixty here. So let me find. So step number one: find the x, y component of all the vectors. So I'm going to start with a sub x. And as you look at the diagram, I hope you already written it. So a sub x is going to be what? It's going to be um, 6 cosine 45 degrees. And that will be 6 times uh, 0.707. I'm going to be using my calculator. Please use yours as well. So let's work together. So I have 6 times 0.707. And that gives me, whoops, uh, 6 times 0.707. And that's equal to 4.2. I'm not going to be putting any units here. A sub y is 6 sine 45 degrees. And that's also the same answer. 
4.2 because cosine 45 and sine 45 are the same, right? And then we have B sub X. B sub X is going to be what? That's going to be uh, 4 cosine 60 degrees. Cosine 60 is half, so that would be 2. And then B sub Y, and watch your sign. B sub Y is going to be negative, correct? Because it's going to be on the bottom. Here, let me, let me go back to the drawing. Right here, B sub Y is going to be down there. So that's going to be negative here, right? You see that, everyone? Whoop. Ah, you know what I mean. Am I in trouble or what? So anyway, I hope I hope you see that. So B sub Y is going to be uh, minus 4 sine 60. And so that sine 60 is 0.866 times 4. And that's equal to 3.5 roughly. And then um, C sub X. What's C sub X? Is minus 8 cosine 30. Cosine 30 is 0.866 as well, 0.866 times 8. Answer, negative 7.2. And then C sub Y is equal to uh, C sub Y. That's going to be uh, sine 30 is half, and that will be equal to 4. So it's going to be uh, sine 30, and that's equal to 4. I hope I didn't make any mistake. Uh, so anyway, though, oh, th there we go. We have them all right here. We have resolved all the vectors into components. Got it? So that's step number one. Now we come to step number two, which basically find R sub X. What is R sub X? It's basically A sub X plus B sub X plus C sub X. So we can just uh, put them in there. That's going to be 4.2 plus 2 minus 7.2. And I can calculate that. So that's going to be 6, uh, 6.2 minus 7.2. 6.2 minus 7.2. Answer negative 1. That's R sub X. I'm going to box it. I'll come back to it in a minute. And then I'm going to get, um, I'll put it here, um, R sub Y. So that will be a sub y plus b sub y plus c sub y. So that's equal to a sub y is 4.2 uh, minus 3.5 plus 4. Is that right? So I have here <clears throat> uh, 4.2 minus 3.5 plus 4. Answer 4.7. Okay, so I have here 4.7. Again, I hope I'm not making any stupid mistakes. So there we go. So we have R sub Y and R sub X. Now, step number three, I hope you already written the recipe. Uh, you want to find the magnitude. And how do you find the magnitude? It's a Pythagorean r equal to square root of r sub x squared plus r sub y squared and that's equal to square root of negative one <clears throat> squared plus 4.7 squared and that will give me let me calculate that so that's going to be so i have here uh 4.7 squared plus one and then under the square root of the answer, answer, 4.8, roughly. So I got 4.8 here. So the magnitude is 4.8. I'll box it. And then the last step is 4 is the direction. And the direction is phi equals to um uh, tan inverse r sub y over r sub x remember it's r y over x if you if you do if you do y over x like this 
you will get the angle with respect to the x-axis okay so w r t x axis with respect to that but if you do phi equals tan inverse of r x over r y you will get the angle w r t with the y axis okay now generally speaking in, in physics we use we find the angle with respect to the x-axis. So that's just a convention. There is nothing wrong with you getting using this one. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. You just be careful. Is it Ry or Rx? So Ry over Rx, uh, which is opposite over hypotenuse, will give you the angle with respect to the x-axis. Just this, just a little tip for you. Okay. So I, I will always use this formula: y over x rather than x over y. You get that? All right. So let's do that. So I have here phi is equal to tan inverse ry. I got ry, I boxed it already. It's right here, 4.7, and rx is negative 1. All right, so I'm going to get a negative answer here. I'll, I'll tell you what that means in a second. So I have here 4.7 over negative 1. So I can find the angle here. So that will be, I use my calculator, inverse tan of negative 4.7. Again, be, uh, make sure that you are set on degrees and the angle is negative 77.9 that's about negative 78 so negative 77 excuse me uh 77.8 77 no actually 78 okay this is uh, uh actually negative 78 degrees that's what it is all right so there we go i have the angle now what's the meaning of all of that all right let's go back to the diagram and i'll show you what that means So keep in mind, I hope you've written it already, Ry is 4.7 and Rx is negative 1, okay? And then, so if I go back to my draw, uh, my, my diagram right here, let me change it to a different color because I want to draw the Ry right on, oops, I'll put it in red. So where is Ry? Well, according to this, um, if I'm going to go with the 78, he said the angle is 70. He said phi is 78 degrees, correct? Negative 78. Negative means below the x-axis. Okay, that's the meaning of it. Okay, so here is the x-axis. Here is the x-axis. We'll go below it to 78. Okay, this is 60. And then you want to go, and then it says that the ang the, the, uh, the, uh, the resultant, excuse me, the magnitude, where is it? I'm missing it. The magnitude is right here. It's 4.8 R. Okay? So what's important is this R and this angle right here. The minus here is below the x-axis. So what I'm going to do, if I go back to the diagram, you remember this um, B is 4. So 4.7 is just a little bit longer but it's going to be at an angle of 78 degrees. So let's suppose that 78 degrees is right here. And it's a little bit longer. Suppose it's right here. So this is the R vector. And that's the angle. 78 degrees. There it is. You got it? In other words, what that means, going back to our table example. So we got those three guys fighting over the table. Right? And the table is situated at the origin, and each of them is, is pulling on it. So this guy is pulling with 8 at an angle of 30 degrees with respect to the x. This guy is pulling with 6. This guy is pulling with 4. Uh, uh, so which direction the table is going to move, as a result of all of that, it's going to move in that direction. You got that? That would be the resultant vector. Okay? Good. Okay. Um, Okay, let me do a problem from the book. Um, I'm going to do problem number 20. Um, yeah, let me go back to the book. Um, I think this one, there we go. Oh, here it is right here. Okay, so uh, number 20 uh, right here says uh, for the three vectors shown, which is right here, 
So we got that. So we have three vectors, A, C, and B, as you can see. A has a, a magnitude of three, C magnitude four, and B it looks like it's unknown. You got that? Okay, you may want to draw that before I make it disappear. And so he said for the three vectors flown, it's given that A plus B plus C is equal to one J. Uh -huh. What is the vector B? That's the question. Uh, write B in component form, write B in magnitude and direction form. When we say magnitude and direction, basically angle, okay? So basically angle with respect to the x-axis, maybe this one here or all the way from there, whatever. All right, so let's, let's work on this. All right, um, let me move it to the side like this. Uh, let's see, I'll move it here. There we go. I want to, I want you to be able to see the drawing. So given that a plus b plus c is equal to 1j, so let's write this one down. So given to us is that a plus b plus c is equal to j. All right. So first of all, looking at the diagram right here, what is a? Well, the a vector in terms of ajk, ijk, is basically 3i. You see that? Uh, and then c is minus 4j. Now, b, however, is completely unknown to us, but we know that it is in the second quadrant, negative x and positive y. It makes sense? So I can write it this way. Minus b sub x i plus b sub y j. You see what I'm saying? I, but I don't know what b x and b y. He actually asked me what it is, what they are. Okay. So I have that. So let me take all of this and put it into the equation that is given to us. All right. So here I have a is a three i uh, minus b x i plus b y j minus 4 j equals j is that okay or 1 j if you will 1 j okay so uh, on either side here and here the i's and j's should match in other words see what i have in here on the other side here i don't have i so that means all the i's here which is this one and this one there is no corresponding j here uh, excuse me, i here, so that means zero. So that means 3i minus bxi is equal to zero i, if you will. There is nothing there. So I have this equation. And then I do the same thing for the j's. Uh, so I have here by minus 4j is equal to 1j. So I have here by b sub y j that is minus 4 j equals 1 j now uh, back to the i this i equation right here um, I can make the i's disappear basically 3 minus b x is equal 0 so therefore b sub x is equal to 3 there we go I got b b sub x and then from this one, the J equation, I have B sub Y minus 4 equals 1. So B sub Y equals 5. And there we go. So now he says, go back to the problem. He says, write B, look at the vector, in terms of component form. Component form is basically I, J. So the B vector in this case for part A is B equals to... Um, 3i plus 5j. That's the component form. You got it? Simple problem, I hope. Now, the second part, um, magnitude and direction. All right, well, let me find the direction. The direction is what? The direction, I mean, look at the vector right here. So we're going to do the same thing. So the direction here is going to be um, phi equal to tan inverse of 
b sub y over b sub x. So b sub y, as you can see, um, uh, I think uh, the b sub the b sub x here should be negative, right? b sub x. I think I have a mistake here. b sub x should be negative, right? I have a positive answer here. That doesn't make sense. I made a mistake somewhere. I have here minus. Uh, so that would be uh, minus b sub x equals zero. So b sub x by itself is that. So that should be minus here, right? Because I already put the minus there. So I have to impose a minus sign here. I am, I am sorry. So there should be a minus sign right here. Make sense? I hope it makes sense for you. So because I, you know, the drawing right here, this is negative here. And I, and I already put the minus here, but I've forgotten about it. I have to, I have to include it. Anyway, so there we go. Now it's, uh, it's written better. All right. So here we have 10 inverse. B sub Y is 5 over negative 3. And that will give me the, the angle. So here I have, I uh, use a calculator right here. So I have a 10 inverse of uh, negative 5 over 3. And the angle is negative 59 degrees. Okay. So that's negative 5, negative 59 degrees. So one way to represent a negative 59 degrees is basically uh, right here, this angle right here. Okay. That would be negative 59. We can also put it down there, but the B is here. So it's basically right here with respect to the negative X axis. You got that? So that will be it. And then uh, I, now, um, what did you say? Um, oh, okay. So he said represented in terms of um, um, magnitude and direction. Well, this is the direction right here, guys. So this is the direction right here. Okay, and the magnitude, well, it's just a Pythagorean. So you simply, what you do is B is equal to B sub X squared plus B sub Y squared. And that will give me a square root of negative three squared plus five squared. Just like that. So that's B equal square root of nine plus 25. And then when I calculate that, <coughs> 9 plus 25, and that would be the square root of the answer. Answer, 5.8, roughly. So it's 5.8, just like that, okay? So there we go. I can either represent it with this nice-looking vector like that, okay? Or with this form, with direction and magnitude. This is magnitude, this is direction. Okay. Okay, good. Um, let me do one more. Number 25. And then I'll move on to, um, to projectile motion. Oh, at the edge, number 25. Let me go back. Okay, uh, number 25. Let me go back to 25 here. Right there. So I have this diagram. He says uh, the, the figure right here uh, shows vectors A and B find vector C such that A plus B plus C is equal to zero. Okay, that's interesting. So here is the uh, the diagram. Please take the time to, you know, kind of draw it. Maybe pause the video and draw it. So we have two vectors. We have X and Y. I have the vector A of length four, and then the vector B of length three. Uh, vector B is 20 degrees below the X axis, and vector A 60 degrees above the X axis. You see that? Okay, and I want to find C such that when I add A, B, and C, I will get the null vector. Okay, this is called a null vector. This one, zero. Okay, so how do we do it? Well, let's make a drawing of it.
trying to keep it on the side so you can see it. All right. So we have a following drawing. Let me, let me draw it. So I have here X and Y like this. And I have the vector A like that. And this is 4. And this angle is 60 degrees. And then I have another vector here. B. And this is 20 degrees. And B is 3. Okay? I want to find C. Where is the location of C? Okay? Um, how do we do it? Well, um, there are several ways of doing it. Uh, let me just try it. So we have that given A plus B plus C gives me the null vector, 0. You got it? Okay. Um, one way to this, there are different ways of doing it, but one way to do it is to uh, let me solve for C. Or rather, as you know, A sub X is e I can find a sub x, a sub y, b sub x, b sub y. That, that's what I'm saying. So a sub x is equal to a cosine 60, which means 40 cosine 60, and that's equal to 2. a sub y, that would be 4 uh, sine 60, so that would be 0.866. I'm going to use my calculator. 0 0.866 times uh, 4. And so 3.6, 3 3, excuse me, 3.46. And then we have B uh, sub X, and that will be 3 cosine 20. So cosine 20 times 3, 2.8. <clears throat> And B sub Y, watch that minus sign, it's going to be negative, right? So it's going to be minus uh, 3 sine 20. So sine 20, sine 20 times 3, answer, negative 1, roughly negative 1, almost exactly. And there we go. I have them all, okay? And what I want to do now I want to saw. I mean, there's so many different ways of doing it. I'm just, I mean, the, the one that pops in my head right now is I can solve for C, which equals to um, minus A minus B. But I know that A as a vector is A sub XI plus B, excuse me, plus A sub YJ, and then B is b sub x i plus b sub y j correct so i'm going to put them in there so that's going to look something like that um minus i look what i'm doing here a sub x plus b sub x minus j a sub y please uh, plus b sub y okay I hope this makes sense to you. I kind of skipped some steps, but uh, if you, you can pause the video and work it out and prove to yourself that this is what you will get. I kind of did it in my head. I hope it's correct. It looks like it's correct. Now, we know that. We know that. We can say, but C vector is what? I C sub X plus J C sub Y, correct? So this must be C sub X, and this must be what? Uh, C sub Y. So now C sub X is equal to minus A sub X plus B sub X, in a parenthesis, okay? And then C sub Y is minus A sub Y plus B sub Y. So let's plug them in. So minus a sub x, I just got them all right there, right? There they are. I made all the calculations right here. So I have here <clears throat> um, 2 plus 
So that gives me ne uh, negative 4.8. I got C sub X. There it is. I'm going to box it. Always box your answers. Always. And then C sub Y is minus A sub Y is right here. 3.46. Uh, uh, and then B sub Y is negative 1. So I have here 3.46 minus 1. And that gives me negative 2.46, and that's C sub Y. There it is. I'm going to box it, and there we go. He said, find, let's go back to the problem. He said, uh, find the vector C such that, blah, 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 right? And write your answer in component form. All right, we'll do that. So I have that, so I found them both. So therefore, here's a component form. C as a vector is equal to negative 4.8i minus uh, 2.46j. And there we go. Again, I hope I'm not making any mistakes here. Um, okay. Okay, wonderful. Um, Okay, I think I'm going to stop here and uh, start on projectile motion. Okay, projectile motion. So, projectile motion, basically, you have an, uh, an object. Uh, let's say this is the ground right here. And I have an object and I throw it up in the air <clears throat> with an angle theta like this. This is the initial velocity, and I project it at an angle theta like that, and then the object will fly off like that, follows a parabolic path, and then it will fall off here. Okay? The distance traveled, the horizontal distance rather, traveled by the object, we call that the range x. And then the height of the object from which it was thrown is y. Of course, here it's zero. For example, let me make another drawing. Suppose that I draw, I throw the object from a height like this, say from a cliff or a top of a building or something. And let's say I throw it with an angle like that. So let's say it falls here. Okay. So this is the range right here, x. This is the height from which the object was thrown. I'm going to call it y, like that, all right? And this is the maximum height reached by the projectile, okay? This is the maximum height. Remember, don't confuse this height with this height, okay? These are different, and they have different ways of, 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 uh, uh, of um, calculating them. And we, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, um, and then you have the time of flight. Okay, so the time of flight of the object. Um, any projectile motion that look like either this one or this one has really two separate motion. One I refer to it as horizontal motion, and the other one is vertical motion. So let me talk about that. Let me just go back to the diagram that I have drawn in the beginning. So I have here is the ground. I'm going to take the most basic one. And then I project the object at an angle, theta, like this. And this is V0, the initial velocity of the object. It flies off like that, and it lands here, right? Okay. So I have, there are two motions, I, I said. One, I call it um, horizontal motion, motion, HM, and VM, vertical motion. Uh, the vertical motion means the... Um, here is the gravity, okay? It's always pointing downward, correct? All right. Um, what happened is that the object here, we're starting from the object here. Here is the object. Of course, we just, you know, we symbolize it as a point. Uh, so the object is here. At you, you know, you kick it or you project it somehow. So it goes up, 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 up. As it is going, it is decelerating, right? It's losing speed. Eventually, it stops here, Okay. And it stops at what I'm saying here is that it has two components for the velocity vector here, this v. Uh, let me let me give you a different color here. So uh, here you have the v naught, like the one right here, 
but this v naught has two components v naught x and then we have v naught y okay and v naught x i'm gonna write it down here v naught x is equal to v naught cosine theta and v naught y is v naught sine theta all right keep that in mind we're gonna come back to those important formulas in a minute okay now as the object is is moving along its trajectory like that okay so what's happening is that it is decelerating slowing down slowing down slowing down until it reaches the summit okay now the velocity of the object here well it has two components v sub x uh, v not uh, v sub x and v sub y what happened is that it stops gaining height at this point make sense and the reason it stops gaining height is because the y component vy is becomes equal zero but the vx component is not zero and that's why it continues on you got that see if both of them are zero what's going to happen to it it's going to plummet like that bam like this it's just going to go and hit the ground like this but that's not what's happening you see what i'm saying so here vy is zero but v not vx is um is not zero zero and that's why it continues on that's one comment the second comment is because <clears throat> gravity is pointing in the vertical direction that's why the the y component of the of the vector the initial one is decreasing slowing down slowing down slowing down until it becomes zero where vx here v naught x is in the horizontal direction it's not in the direction of gravity this vector is actually not influenced by it at all what i'm trying to say by that is that let me just take this out <clears throat> if i take any point on the trajectory let's say here the v naught the v the vy the y component is actually slower so it's going to be a shorter vector here's even shorter and this one is really short and this is zero right here right however the x component is exactly equal to that it does not change at all all of them are equal to v naught x why is that because there is no gravity in the y direction that's why okay now after it passes the summit right here what's going to happen the converse happens so now it is falling down and you will uh, you'll see that the vector in the y direction is gaining velocity so the point right here is going to be pointing down the velocity and it's getting longer or bigger it's faster excuse me faster by the time it comes here it will be exactly equal to the vector v naught y here by symmetry okay and then again but v naught x is exactly the same all through why because there is no gravity in the horizontal direction there is no forces if you will in the horizontal direction so this is very important and so we have here two separate motion one motion in the vertical direction it's an accelerated motion and then the 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 horizontal motion however is not accelerated motion there is no gravity therefore there is no acceleration the velocity is the same all through throughout the the, the trajectory here so nothing is happening here so um so when i ask the question what is the range of a projectile here you know the how far did the projectile go well that would be horizontal motion x equals to v naught x t that's the formula that we're going to be using where for the for the uh, uh the vertical motion well we have kinematics you got three of them the one i'm going to be using is the third one y equals v naught y t minus one half gt squared okay i mean there are three of them here they are v y equals v naught y minus g t v y squared equals to v naught y squared minus 2 g y i hope you're familiar with them uh and then we have here y equals v naught y t minus one half g t squared you can use whichever one you want they're all equivalent 
but the one that I'm going to be using for, uh, I mean, I would say 70% of the problem that you work on projectile, probably this equation will suffice. This one right here will be good enough. Sometimes you'll, you need to work on one on others. That's fine. But that's the one I'm going to be using for the next couple of problems. Okay. Uh, so let me give you an example and show you how that works. Uh, let, me, let me just make one more comment. Look at the variables here and the variables here. As you can see, those variables are not the same. You see that? There is a Y. There is no Y here. There is X and V not X. Uh, X and V not X are not here. The only variable that links the two motions together is just the time. So the time here and the time here is the same thing. Okay? But all the other variables are different from each other. Okay? They're not related to each other, if you know what I mean. Okay? All right. Uh, let me let me go an example. So let's say I have an example. Um, example, uh, let me go back to the book. Uh, bear with me. 4.4. Okay, it says... Um, It says a stunt man drives a car off a 10 meter high cliff at the speed of 20 point. You know, let me let me get the book. I'm sorry. Let, let me let me get the book. I think that would be a better idea rather than trying to. Okay, we are in chapter four. Uh, I should have prepared that before I started the lecture. Um, Let me, let me stop the video. Okay, here we are. Uh, this is the example that I'm talking about. He says, example 4.4, don't try this at home. Uh, it says, a stuntman drives a car off a 10 meter high cliff at a speed of 20 meters per second. How far does the car land from the base of the cliff? And then we have a picture right here. There it is. So here's the car. Here's the cliff. He drives it off and then it lands right there, okay? And I want to know the distance traveled by the car here, the range, okay? Simple problem, I hope. So let's do it. So here is always draw a free body diagram. Always, always, always make your life much easier. So here is my diagram right here. Here's the cliff. Here is the car. And so he's going to drive it off the cliff. Ugh, it's not very good, is it? Uh, uh, let's say it lands right here, okay? And so this is the range of the projectile X. And this is the height of the cliff. These variables are important. And then we have the initial velocity of the car. Notice that the initial velocity is in the horizontal direction. So in other words, there is no Y component. V not Y is zero. Okay, just the nature of the problem. Not always, but just the nature of the problem for this one. Okay, um, and he says it's equal to, is given to us, two meters per second. If you go back to the problem, it's two meters per second like that. And then the height of the cliff is 10 meters. That's about 30 feet. And then he wants to know, find <clears throat> x. Okay? So, again, I'm going to go back to what I just showed you. I always, every time I solve a projectile problem, I use this technique. Okay? That's my own personal technique. Horizontal motion, vertical motion. And I put in the same formulas that you are looking at. And then I would put in all the numbers that I have that given to me, that are given to me. And then I see if I can solve the two problem, the two equations simultaneously. Okay? So let's try it. So I'm going to go like this. HM, VM, X equals V naught XT, Y equals V naught YT minus one half GT squared. As we said, the car initially is in the x direction. There is no y component. So this one is 0 right there. So I have here y equals minus 1 half gt squared. What's the height? 
10 meters, right? Actually, no, it's negative 10 meters. And I think we talked about that last lecture. The reason for that, just to remind you, here is the car. You have an X and Y coordinate here. Here is the X. Here is the Y. And I'll put it in a different color and show you. For those of you who don't remember. So here I have X and Y right there. Here is X. Excuse me, here is Y. Here is X right here. Here is Y. That's the origin of the coordinate. Anything below it is measured in negative Y direction. Excuse me, or negative Y coordinate. So this should be negative. Make sense? So, and you want it to be negative. Why? Because if you want this negative to, so in order for it to cancel with this negative, because you are going to be solving for t, you're going to be taking the square root. You don't want to be taking the square root of a negative number, would you? So you want it to be negative anyway. All right, so we have that. So again, like I said, just write down, put everything that you got. So I'm looking, let me look, start with x. So I'm looking for x. I don't know what it is. V not x is given to me. It's right here. So I have 20 here times t. I have this equation right there. Oops, I reached the edge here. Let me move it to the others. So I have here, here is my equation right there. And what I want to do now, I start from this one. I have negative 10 equals negative 1 half times 9.8 t squared. So that would be 10 equals 4.9 t squared. So t equals 10 over 4.9. So I have here 10 divided by 4.9. Take the square root of that. <clears throat> and I got 1.43. So the time is 1.43 seconds. So the stuntman in the air for this time. And then I go back and plug it in there. So therefore, x equals to 20 times 1. oh, 1.43, oops, sorry, I keep making mistakes here, 1.43, and then I would uh, get the answer uh, 28.6 roughly, 28.6 meters, there we go, so the stuntman's car will fly off and land at 26, 28.6 meters away from the foot of the cliff. Got it? Okay, good. Um, let's do one more. Um, go back to the book. Oh, I have one here in my notes. Let me do it very quickly. Actually, two before I do the book. Um, Here's another one here. This one is an easy one, but it's kind of comprehensive. It gives you a good uh, overall understanding of what how projectile motion are working. So what you have in here, imagine you are standing on top of a cliff or on top of the building or something. Here is the height of the building, if you will. You throw an object with an angle like that. Okay, and so it goes up, 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 and then it lands like this, all right? Um, of course, that path is parabolic. And V naught here is 20 meters per second. And the height <clears throat> is 43 meters. Again, it's negative, right? Because you have the datum. I hope you will remember that. And this is the range of the projectile x like that and we have four questions okay first question um so here we have a stone throne that's basically the statement of the problem stone throne and then you know the rest of the story right you get the rest of the data all right part a uh, how long the stone is in flight how long stone in flight? Okay. Part B.
speed of the stone just before it hit the ground. Remember, the ground is right here. The stone hit it right there. So the speed of the stone right before it hit the ground right there. And then part C, he says the range. In other words, the range X, that is. Okay, how far is going to go from the, from the, from the, you know, foot of the cliff or whatever it is. Okay, so how do we do this one? Well, let's start with the first problem. Uh, first question, and that is how long, which means he's looking for time. Okay, the, this long means time here. All right. So again, I'm going to use the same technique that I showed you. I'm going to put in my horizontal motion, vertical motion, horizontal motion, the usual equation, x equals v naught x t, and the vertical motion is y v naught y t minus one half g t squared. Okay. Before I do anything else, I go back to this drawing. I hope you've you've written it already in your notes. So I'm going to get uh, again. Let me put it in different color. So I'm going to get V, um, I forgot the angle, sorry about that. There is the angle here, 30 degrees. So I'm going to get uh, V naught X and then V naught Y, is that right? So I need to get those, let me put them here on the side. V naught X is going to be what? 20 cosine 30, and that will be equal to, let me get that number, 20 cosine 30. So cosine 30 is 0.866 times 20, answer 17.3 meters per second, right? And V naught Y is 20 sine 30. Sine 30 is half, so that makes it 10 meters per second, right? There we go, we got them both. You always want to get those first, get them out of the way. Now, whoop, back to our horizontal and vertical motion. Now I'm going to put in everything. Always, this is the first thing you do. You put in all the numbers that, or the given data that you have, and then see how you can do the mathematics, the calculation. Okay, so he's looking for T. So I have, as you know, I got T's here and here, both. I don't know the range x, so I have x equals v naught x is equal to, I already forgot what it is, v naught x is 17.3 right there. <clears throat> so I have here 17.3t. Let me box this equation because I have too many, uh, two unknowns, one equation, two unknowns, I can't do it. So I'm just going to leave it the way it is. Now I come to the vertical equation. Y is given to me, it's right here, but you want to watch your sign. This is below the datum. That makes it negative, okay? So you want to be very careful about that. So that's going to be negative 43 equals to V naught Y, which is 10T minus half G is 4.9 T squared. You see that? So I have this one. As you can see, this is doable. This is a quadratic equation. So I need to solve the quadratic equation. So I have here... Um, so let me write it in the proper way. So I have here um, 4.9 t squared minus 10 t minus 43 equals zero. Um, okay, so there we go. So now I'm going to use the quadratic formula to solve it. So that will be uh, t equals to minus b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac divided by 2a and then i'm going to work it out okay and i am not going to do it here i think you should be able i mean i am assuming you know how to do that and you're going to work it out and then you will end up getting the following time time is equal to 4.15 second okay uh, i believe you will get to get 
two numbers, one negative, which is unphysical, and then one uh, neg uh, one positive, and that will be the time. So there we go. We have the time. Okay? Good. Uh, that's the first part of the problem. Now we come to the second part. <clears throat> the second part, he says, um, what is the speed just before it hit the ground? Now let me, before I do that, let me find part C. Part C is easy because why is it easy? He's asking for the range. Well, the range is x equals 17.3 t. Well, I already got the t's right here. So, uh, so that would be easy. Let me just work on t, uh, part C first. So x equals 17.3 t. So that will be 17.3 times 4.15. And that will give me um, 17 times 4.15. And that will give me um, 71.89, which is about 72. In my notes, I have 72. Let's keep it 72. So I have 72 meters. And there we go. That's the range of the projectile, the range of the stone. Okay, the stone is going to land. 72 meters away from the foot of the cliff. That's, that's basically the meaning of it. All right. Okay. Now the hard part, which is part B. This is probably the hardest one. So what's happening here? I want to find the Y component here. Okay. Let me, I want, what I want to do now, I want to draw only this part. Okay. I'm going to draw it in a free body diagram way. I want to show you what's going on here. Whoops. Watch and pay attention to this. So the way it looks is that here is the projectile going like that before it lands. Here's the ground. This is the path of the projectile, right? This is the path of the projectile. So let's suppose that right before it hit the ground, here is the stone, right before it hit the ground. So it would have two components, one this way and one this way. Agree with me on that? I'm trying to make it as vertical as I can. There we go. Okay. So this is VY, this is VX. Now, the stone, of course, is going to go, it's going to hit right here, right? But these are the two components just before it hit the ground. Think of like the distance here is like an infinitesimal distance, okay? So tiny, it's negligible, you know what I mean? But that's bad. I'm exaggerating the way it looks. But that's how it looks like. Now, the question is, what is the value of V sub X and the value of V sub Y? Well, as we argued you know, just a few minutes ago, V sub X, remember, because the, the X component is not along the direction of gravity, it doesn't change. In other words, the X component all through the trajectory here, the X component, this is here, all over here. all over is exactly the same as that okay so the x component really is just 17.3 okay so i can just go back and just say well v sub x is 17.3 got it meter per second the problem is the troublemaker is the v sub y well how do i find that now, by symmetry, it's not going to work out. I mean, um, V sub Y maybe here is equal to this one. But down there, I don't know. You see what I'm saying? It's not equal to that. It's not necessarily equal to it. Okay? So how do we do it? Well, here is, this is where, well, that's why the problem is a little bit tough. Here is where we come back to the kinematic equations. And I like this one, the one in the middle, that doesn't, the one that doesn't have time. So I know what is the initial velocity, and this is the y, the y, the, the y component of the velocity at any height y. Isn't that cool? So give me the height. I can tell you what is the corresponding one. Another one is this one, too. See, I can find vy if you give me the time. Okay, the one that I find convenient for the, for our problem, I mean, both are fine, but I would probably find more convenient this one because I already know the total time. I mean, just before it hit the ground, that basically the time of flight, I already got that number, which is, uh, what is it, 4.15 seconds. So by putting time 4.15 seconds here and the initial time, excuse me, the initial velocity, 
I will get the corresponding vy. You get that? Okay. So I need to find vy and vx. Well, vx is basically v not equal to v not x, which is 17.3 meter per second. Always. Okay, now Vy, how do I do that? Well, I, again, I appeal to the first kinematic equation, Vy equals V naught Y minus GT, okay? And, <clears throat> and Vy is equal to 10 minus 9.8 times the total time by the time it gets here, and that will be equal to, I already found it from the quadratic formula, right there what is it uh here this quadratic formula right here and whoop, and there it is 4.15 so i can plug it in there 4.15 and then i would calculate that so that will give me <clears throat> 9.8 times 4.15 minus 10 and watch your minus signs now and i will get negative 30 oops negative 30 sorry negative 30.7 meter per second. Is the negative okay or not okay? It gotta be okay, why? Because this is a velocity and the minus, C, the minus sign indicates it's going down, which it's true, right, see that? It is going down, so I better get that negative. Actually, it tells me that I have been, uh, I have been uh, uh, doing my sign correctly. I have been calculating my signs correctly. And there we go, so now I have the velocity uh, so going back, he said, what is the speed? What's the speed mean? Well, speed means it's a magnitude, right? So, you know, just like the R vector, remember the R vector is R sub X squared plus R sub Y squared. Well, the speed is the, the magnitude of the velocity. That means the speed V is equal to V sub X squared plus V sub Y squared. That's the meaning of this is speed. Actually, the Pythagorean is speed, not velocity. Okay, so I can just go and then say, okay, V sub X is equal to, uh, what is it, 17.3, um, 17 quantity squared plus negative 30 squared, and then we can calculate that, and my answer is 30.7 meter per second. Okay. Okay, one more question. Okay, um, I think I discovered the mistake. I don't think it's, I think I copied uh, 30.7. This is Vy. Uh, I think the correct answer here is, uh, I just did my calculator because it didn't make sense to me. It's actually, uh, sorry about that, 35.2. So that's the speed, okay? Okay, um, the next problem, again, from my notes, kind of a cool problem. Imagine a basketball player, okay, of course, basketball players are tall, and so he is throwing the ball to the basket, and he's dunking the ball into the basket. So let's draw this picture. So here is the, here is the wall, or the, what do you call that, the pole uh, that holds the basket. I, I don't, uh, I'm not a big basketball player, I don't know much about it, but here is, here is the basket right here. It looks something like that. There we go. Is that better? And you have the basketball players right here. And there's his arm holding the ball. Uh, trying to draw his legs kind of jumping or whatever, but anyway, I don't know how to do that either. 
So let's give him a personality. There you go. Okay, so what he was doing is throwing the ball and it's landing in the basket like that, okay? Suppose that the ball, the, the ball speed, initial speed here, V naught, the angle is 45 degrees, let's call that theta. And let's say the basket is 30 point, excuse me, 3.05 meters. Probably these are correct numbers, I'm not sure. And the, 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 the player is <clears throat> 10 meters away from the basket. That's the range of the projectile, you see what I'm saying? Um, and the height of the ball, remember this is the height of the ball, okay, from here, uh, is which what we care about. We don't care about the height of the guy, right? The height of the ball, because that's the one that is projected, not the height of the person. So anyway, so we have here, whoops. You try to erase something and the whole line is erased. I never understand that. Anyway, so we go. Okay, now the question is find find V naught, the initial speed of the ball, and the time of flight of the ball before it hit the basket. You got that? Okay. So what makes this diff diff uh, this problem different and a little bit difficult is that here we have two heights. Okay. I'm going to show you how to solve it. It's not a big deal. So again, like usual, we have <clears throat> horizontal motion, vertical motion. The same, uh, the, the same formula that we use, x equals v naught x t, and y equals v naught y t minus one half g t squared. Got it? Again, on the side right here, let me get, I'll uh, use a different color. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to calculate V naught Y and V naught X. So V naught X, <clears throat> V naught X is equal to V naught cosine 45. Oh, I'm sorry. The, the theta here, I forgot to mention it's 45 degrees. Okay. So that makes it, uh, 0.707 v naught. So this is v naught x. I'm going to box it. I still don't know what it is, but I'm going to draw it like that. And then I have v naught y is equal to v naught sine 45 degrees. And as you know, cosine and sine are the same. So v naught y is also 0.707 v naught. Again, I'm going to put them like that. Because I can plug him right in here, v naught x and v naught y with that, and then hopefully something will happen. Some magic will happen. So remember, I'm I'm looking for the time of flight, and I'm looking for v naught. Got it? Okay. So how do we do it? Again, you just want to be, uh, you know, apply the rules that I've given you. You have those two formulas, h m v m, horizontal motion, vertical motion. Plug in all the data that is given to you in the problem. And then look at the two equations and see if you can solve them simultaneously, so you can, if you can do something with them. You know what I mean? So the only problem here is that I have two heights. You see that? I have this height and this height. Well, this height is basically the net between them. Because see, the, where is the action? The action is right here. Let me use a different color. See, what's going on here is that the action, the height of the the player is not important. What's happening, really? This is the action. The action is happening right here. Okay? So I'm given this height, this height, from here to the ground, and then the, the, the from here to the ground, you know, the, the height, of, the initial height of the ball, and the final height of the ball, if you will. Well, I just, the action is really going on in here. So Y is really that. This is, this Y is this one right here, which is basically what? 3.05 minus 2. Got it? Now, the question is, is this number, here, let, let, let me write it down. So that would be 3.05 minus 2, which is 1.05 meters. Now, here is the question. 
this number that I'm talking about, this 1.05, is it positive or negative? Oops, sorry. Is it positive or negative? The answer is positive because why is it positive? Let me change the color. Put a blue maybe. Look, here is X and Y. Here is my datum. Here is X. Uh, excuse me, here is Y. Here is X. Look at the height. The height is this way. Above. See that? So that makes it positive. You got it? So it's a positive height. So now I know what Y is from with this from these arguments. Now I'm ready to plug in all these numbers in there into those two equations. And I'm basically, I'm done with the problem. I can just solve it right now. So let's do that. I hope all of this is clear for you. So x is 10. v naught x is 0.707 v naught t. Box it. I don't know. I have two unknowns here. I can't do it. I'll leave it there and come back to it later. Y is 1.05 positive. V naught Y is V, uh, excuse me, uh, 0.707 V naught times T minus 4.9 T squared. You see that? So what do I have in here? It looks like I have a quadratic equation. Not exactly. I have two unknowns here. Look at that. V naught T. And I have, see what I'm saying? I can't really use a quadratic formula because I have too many unknowns here. You have one equation, two unknowns. But here is the good news. Look at that. V naught T, V naught T, or actually 0 0.707 V naught T. This whole thing is equal to what? Is equal to 10. Well, look at that. This whole thing must be equal to 10. See that? So I can just do this 1.05 equals 10 minus 4.9 t squared so what's cool about the problem this problem is that if you don't see certain things it becomes really difficult but if you can see those things it's almost trivial okay anyway so move the 10 to the other side so i have 1.05 minus 10 equals minus 4.9 t squared again the minuses are going to cancel out as you can see 1.05 minus 10 and that gives me um negative 8.95 equals negative 4.9 t squared and then the rest is easy i can solve for time you will end up getting uh 1.35 second there we go i got the time and that's it uh, once you get the time everything becomes easy so now I come back to this. We have 10 equals 0 0.707 V naught times 1.35. And then you solve for V naught, and then you'll end up getting 10.46 meter per second. And there we go. Okay. Okay, great. Um, Maybe one more problem, and I will uh, finish this lecture. Um, uh, let me pause the video. And I'll come back to you. I want to look for a problem. Okay, I'm going to do problem number 16 for the textbook. Here it is. right here uh, it says on the Apollo 14 mission to the moon astronaut Alan Shepard hit a golf ball with a six iron uh, the six iron is I guess the size of the golf club something like that uh, so this is not important for the solution of the problem okay uh, anyway so the free fall acceleration on the moon is one six that of earth okay so in other words the earth is 9.8 the moon is i believe 1.67 we'll calculate it's one over six of that suppose he hit the ball with a speed of 25 meter per second at an angle of 30 degrees above the horizontal how much farther did the ball travel on the moon than it would have on earth that's part a and b <clears throat> 
how uh, excuse me for how much more time was the ball as in flight in other words you want to calculate the time of flight on the moon and the earth and then you want to take the difference between them all right so and then you want to also you want to calculate the range uh on the moon the, the range of this flight uh, excuse me the range of the ball on the moon and on the earth got it okay so kind of a cool nice problem so let's work it out so i'm going to make a diagram as well so i have something like this again this is just surface to surface so the there is no height y so it looks something like this here is the projection the initial velocity is 25 meter per second oops 25 meter per second for both situation at an angle of uh, uh i forgot what it is um 30 degrees And then it goes, lands here. And of course, on the moon, it's going to land a little bit longer, right? So that's basically X for both of them. I'm just drawing one diagram that fits both of them. So that's basically what we have. Um, so to solve it, um, let's do the Earth first. Or b before I do that, let me just use my usual technique of solving a problem like that horizontal motion vertical motion x equals to v naught x t and then here y equals v naught y t uh, minus one half g t squared again i keep forgetting let's use a different color so i want to calculate uh, v naught y and v naught x it's very important that we do, do that initially got it out of the way that's going to be 25 cosine 30 for the x component right so uh, cosine 30.866 times 25 and so 21.7 meter per second this is for v naught x and then v naught y is 25 sine 30 sine 30 is half so 25 uh, uh, divided by 2 is 12.5. Uh, so it's going to be 12.5 meter per second. There we go. I have them all. Uh, those, this, this data apply to both Earth and, uh, and the Moon. So I'm going to plug in all of that in there. The only difference between them, guys, is basically the G value. This value right here. Everything else... Is pretty much the same. The T will adjust itself, though. Okay. So anyway, so that's basically what it is. So let's start with um, again. Let, let me just plug in the numbers. So I have here x equals to twenty-one point seven T, and then y is zero, right? Look at that. What's the height of the projectile here? Zero. See that? So start. I mean, this is the, this is the meaning of y. Is either this or that, and then if there are, there are two heights here, take the difference between them. But basically, that's that's what it is. So the height is here, zero, and v naught y is equal to twelve point five t minus. Uh, be careful, you don't want to do four point nine. That's one half g t squared. Okay. Um, so I have those two. I have those two equations. Now let's begin with the Earth, and then they'll apply to the Moon. So let's start with the Earth. So that's going to be, I'm going to come back, uh, I'm going to use the second equation right here, the vertical motion. So it's going to be 0 equals 12.5 t minus 4.9 t squared. Is that right? Take t as a common factor. So I have 12.5 minus 4.9 t squared equals 0. Oops, not t squared, t. And and then we solve for it. I hope you, are, you know what I, you know how to do the math. That's the easy part divided by 4.9 and there we go that will give me the time of flight on earth you know what i mean so it's going to be 12.5 divided by 4.9 answer 2.55 second so the the golf ball is in the air on earth for 2.55 seconds now let's do the same thing i'm going to use the same formula except it's going to be on the moon 
So I'm going to use the same formula. This is for Earth. So the same thing for the Moon. So that's going to be, uh, sorry, not this one. Uh, what I meant, I want to use this one right here, right? So that's going to be 0 equals 12.5 T minus 1 half 1.67 T squared. Why is that? Well, it is. he said the G on the moon is 1 over 6 of G on Earth. This is the moon. This is the Earth. These are the symbol of the Earth and the moon. So basically 1 over 6. So that's 9.8 divided by 6. I think it's 1.67. I've always memorized it. 1.63. 1.63, sorry. Okay, 1.63. There we go. Meter per second squared. All right, so we plug it in. And we do the same thing. So 1.63 times 0.5. And that gives me um, T 12.5 minus 0.82 T equals 0. Okay? Uh, if I did it correctly, so then T is equal to 12.5 over 0.82, as you can see, it's much longer. So that's 12.5 divided by 0.82. It's going to be a whopping 15. Did I do it right? Like right? Uh, I hope I did. I am. I hope uh, I am doing all of that correctly. 15.2 second. I'm not making any stupid mistakes. And there we go. As you can see, it's definitely. Uh, the time is significantly lo longer. You see what I'm saying? Now, we come to the range now. So, uh, back to the Earth here. And the range, basically, we're going to use this formula. So, let me put it here. Let me just squeeze it here with a different color. Uh, let's use red. How about that? So, the range for Earth... It's going to be 21.7 times 2.55. Here's the 2.55 right here, the time. So how far is it going to go? Uh, 2.55 times 21.7. Answer, 55.3 meters. So it's going to go on Earth, that is, 55.3 meters. On the moon, however... It's going to be much longer, as you can see. So the X on the moon, that's going to be um, 20, uh, is it 21? Yeah, 21.7 times the time on the moon. So that's going to be 21.7 times 15.2. 21.7 times 15. Point, I'm using my calculator. A 330 meters. Uh, according to the book, 331. We are close enough. And there we go. That's on the moon. Okay. Okay, I think I'm going to stop here for this chapter. Bye-bye.